everyone, this is Jason Lamb with Dare to Share Ministries. Thanks so much for joining us for another episode of Gospelize with Greg Steer, Youth Ministry with a Kick. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to the podcast and then take a minute to rate it, review it, repost it, and help us get the word out to all of your friends. As you're listening today, we've got digital resources that are available on Greg's website, a listening guide, a discussion guide, and then the outline of the sermon for you to use. And so make sure you download those as you listen to Greg. Today, he's unpacking three dot theology. And then when he's done with his sermon, Carrie and I will do takeaways, tips, and tools. So be sure to stay around for that. With all of that said, here's Greg Steer. Hey, welcome to the Gospelized Podcast. My name is Greg Steer. Uh, we're going to be talking to you today about three dot theology. I know it sounds weird. We're going to talk about God's sovereignty, urgency when it comes to evangelism, and responsibility, human responsibility to believe. This ties in to where your teenagers are at when it comes to motivating them to pray and reach their friends with the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I'm going to start by asking you a question. Have you ever met a teen who could not quite connect the dots between curiosity and danger? And I know you're thinking of one particular teen right now in your youth group, right? The kid always getting in trouble. Uh, I was that Teenager. I could not connect the dots between curiosity and danger. I mean, from the time I was like 12, 13 years old, I remember I was at my grandparents' house down in their basement, and I'd love to be in the basement because I love to look at cool old people's stuff. I remember going through the drawers and seeing what they had, you know, finding an old pair of false teeth, uh, just jars full of buttons. I don't know why old people like jars full of buttons. I think it was a 30s thing, but lots of buttons. And then I remember finding this one can, a black can, that was pretty good size, and it said, Paralyzer Mace. And then small print, do not spray in face. And I'm thinking to myself, Paralyzer, hmm, that's a cool term. Curiosity, danger, not connecting the dots. And I'm thinking to myself, Paralyzer. Now, I've heard of Mace, and I've heard that it will mess you up, but I never heard that it will paralyze you. And frankly, I didn't believe it. I did not believe it would paralyze me. So I thought I would do an experiment. I shook the can up and I sprayed it away from me in the basement. And I waited for that fog of mace to kind of swirl around to see if I'd get paralyzed. And nothing happened, right? So I shook it up again, I sprayed it again, and this time I kind of jumped in the fog, (laughs) breathed in a little bit, Again, not connecting the dots. Nothing happens. Finally, I take a piece of paper. I spray it all over the piece of paper. I bring it up to my face. Something happened. Something happened in that moment because I suddenly, I literally felt paralyzed. I started drooling. Boogers were coming from my nose. I started screaming, no, 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 I'm paralyzed. And my grandmother comes running down the stairs as fast as a grandmother can. She's like, what's going on? I said, there's pretty mace in my face. I'm truly paralyzed. And she's like, oh, no, don't tell your grandfather. He's coming down the stairs. Tell him you smell, smell, smell perfume. I'm like, what? And she goes, tell him you smell perfume. He'll get mad if you sprayed mace in your face. He comes down the stairs. He's like, what's going on? I go, I have smell perfume. He goes, what? I go, I have smell perfume and I like it. I like it a lot. He says, boy, you have problems. I said, yes, I do. I have lots of problems. And yes, I do. I have lots of problems. Not connect the dots between curiosity and danger. Well, I want to talk to you today about not connecting the dots between three truths. Sovereignty, urgency, and responsibility. When it comes to evangelism and when it comes to motivating your teens to share their faith. Because I know we have all sorts of theological persuasions listening. We have those who are more reformed that talk about God choosing us before the foundation of the earth. We have those who are more Arminian that believe, well, it's really on us. And we have people that are in the middle. So I want to share with you three theological truths that no matter what your theological background, I think you'll walk away with something for you to embrace and something for you to communicate to your teenagers to motivate them to gospelize their friends. So let's take a look at dot number one, sovereignty. It's God's job to save. It's God's job to save. Jonah 2.9, salvation comes from the Lord. 
God is sovereign. That means he's in control of everything in this universe, including salvation. Matter of fact, I believe we're utterly unable um, to do anything good before God in and of ourselves. Isaiah 64, 6 says, our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. God says even our righteous deeds, our good deeds are like filthy rags. And in the Hebrew, it's much more graphic. In this culture, filthy rags represented used menstrual rags. So a pile of used tampons is the idea here. Our good deeds to God are like that. That's how graphic God is about even our good deeds. There's nothing we could do in and of ourselves to please God. God must take that light switch in our soul and turn it from off to on. That's why we pray. That's why we must pray for the lost and get our teenagers to pray for their lost friends because salvation comes from the Lord. I think sometimes we forget the power of prayer. I know I do. I saved in a Baptist church, raised in a Bible church. Uh, we prayer, yeah, we we prayed, but it was like holy water. We'd use it to open a service. Lord bless this service and close the service. Yeah, bless what was just happened. But we'd pray before dinner, but it wasn't like calling out to God on behalf of someone. It wasn't true intercessory prayer. All that began to change in my life about 19 years ago. I was in Washington, D.C. with a bunch of youth ministry leaders at the Youth Ministry Executive Council, top denominational leaders, top parachurch leaders, and me. I feel really out of place. I'm the Dare to Share guy. <laughs> Hello, FCA man. And there's all these great ministries. All my heroes in youth ministry are there. And we take time to pray. And it was awesome. We broke up into different groups. There were the Baptists. Every once in a while, you'd hear an amen kind of coming from there. Yeah, the parachurch guys at another table. I don't think they were praying. I think they were talking sports. That's fine. Uh, and then all these different kind of denominations. And somehow I got stuck at the Pentecostal table, the Pentecostal table, right? Now, I, I have a lot of Pentecostal friends. But again, saved in the Baptist church, raised in a Bible church. I myself am not Pentecostal. But for those few moments, I became one, right? Because if you're Pentecostal and you're watching this, you know, you know how to pray. When you guys, man, pray, it's like a, it's like a, I mean, let's, you get hepped up. I mean, banners are going to come out flying around. I mean, people are going to be dancing. I mean, it's intense. And I'm at this prayer time and the guy who's leading the prayer time, his name is Bob. And Bob came in the room. I'll never forget when he came in the room. He kind of kicked in the door and I just expected a fog machine. He comes out, he's dressed to the hilt, looking sharp. He's got gold, gold rings on his fingers and he's got Elvis-like hair. And he'd been on TBN, CBN, you name a BN, and he'd been on it. And it was like, hey, everybody, uh -huh, my name is Bob. And I'm like, okay, what's happening? Is this a sketch? And it wasn't. We're, he's at our table and he's leading the prayer time. What's your prayer request? What's your prayer request? And the first guy was like, I want to claim a million souls from a ministry. He goes, well, let's claim it in the name of Jesus. And he starts going and our table is getting louder and louder and louder. All the other tables are quiet. Our table is getting hepped up. Every once in a while, I try to keep in. I say, make it so, Lord. Just get, try to get in, right? It's a Pentecostal prayer time. He's going around a circle and gets to me. And I think, man, I, he's going he's gonna to have an aneurysm. I need to pray for something personal because they're praying for all their ministries. Maybe personal stuff will calm him down. He's like, what's your prayer request? I go, can you pray for my wife and I uh, to have kids? We've been married for 10 years. We can't have kids. And that was the wrong thing to say to Bob. Because Bob goes, I prayed for hundreds of couples. They never failed to have children. He goes, get around, boys. I'm like, no, no, no. They get up out of their seats. They grab me by the head. And he starts praying, dear God, right now I pray you touch this man's sperm and bring it to life. I'm like, no, 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 no. He's like, and bring, it, uh, bring him together with his wife in a holy collision of life and love. I'm like, mental picture, mental picture, mental picture. He prays for what seems like hours. He gets finished. He looks at me. He goes, it is done. It is done in the name of Jesus. I go, it ain't quite done yet, Bob. Because faith without works is dead. And I don't think you can use the word sperm in a prayer. Three weeks later, we found out two months later, traced it back. Three weeks later, my wife got pregnant. I sent him a postcard. Dear Bob, it is done. Then he invited me to his TV show. I go, oh, no, I'm not going on your TV show. But it was awesome because even though I may differ with Bob theologically on some of the finer points of theology, let me tell you, he prayed like Jesus was standing there and he prayed on my behalf and he believed that God could. And it rebuked me. 
Because I thought, man, how many times do I not pray in faith? How many times do you not pray in faith? Believing God can and will do what is best for us. He doesn't always say yes to our prayer request. Sometimes he says no. Sometimes he says yes. Sometimes he says wait. But he always gives us what's best. That is, that's God when we pray. He always gives us what's best. And we need to learn to pray uh, for others when it comes to their salvation. Why? Because God is sovereign in salvation. I think of my Uncle Richard. My Uncle Richard, uh, I talk about my family being radically transformed by the power of the gospel. My Uncle Richard was the one holdout. You know, four of my uncles get radically saved. My mom gets saved. My Uncle Richard doesn't want to have anything to do with his family that came to Jesus. He thought they were all Jesus freaks. And all my big bodybuilding uncles would start sharing Christ with him. He'd say, hey guys, shut it down. I don't want to talk to you. I'm not going to get involved in your little religious cult. He thought my family had lost their mind. Uh, when my grandpa died when I was 15 years old, my uncles asked me to give the gospel at my grandpa's funeral. And I did. It was like 500 people there. And there was one person I was really thinking about. It was my Uncle Richard. So I give the gospel. I give an invitation. Have everybody bow their heads and close their eyes. Everybody bow their heads, close their eyes, except for Uncle Richard. He's just sitting there like this, like, you ain't getting me, boy. And uh, afterward, he didn't trust Christ. Afterward, I uh, tried to talk to him. My uncles tried to talk to him. He shut us all down. Um, so you know what we did? Um, we wrote a letter. Uh, I wrote a letter, sent it to him, called him up, said, uh, Uncle Richard, did you get my letter? He goes, yep, because I laid the gospel out in the letter. He goes, how's your mom? Just shut me down. So we, be we began to pray. We just said, you know what, we're going to pray. Every time we saw him, we tried to share Christ, but we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed because we believe in that first dot, dot number one, right? Dot number one, it's God's responsibility to save. And God is the one we must appeal to. So that's dot number one is uh, God's sovereignty. He's in charge. So we need to pray. We need to get our kids to pray. Dot number two is urgency. It's urgency. In other words, there's an urgency for us. It's our responsibility. It's your job and my job to share the gospel. It's our job to share. Romans 10, 14 says, How then can they call on the one whom they've not believed in? How can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? So think about this just for a moment. Right in the middle of the classic passage on God's election, Romans 9 through 11, right in the middle, Paul the Apostle, who's talking about God's sovereignty and evangelism, says, how can they hear without someone preaching to them? In other words, yes, it's God's responsibility, to, it's God's job to save, it's your job to share. And there's an urgency to it. I think sometimes we miss that out in this culture. We miss out on that in this culture. Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 7 through 9, Ezekiel says these words, Son of man, I have made you a watchman for the people of Israel. And a watchman was somebody who stood up on the gates and looked out for incoming enemies. Uh, he says, So hear the word I speak and give them warning from me. When I say to the wicked, You wicked person, you will surely die, and you do not speak out to dissuade them from their ways, that wicked person will die for their sin, and I will hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn the wicked person to turn from their ways, and they do not do so, they will die for their sin, though you yourself will be saved. So what God is telling Ezekiel is, it's your job to blow the trumpet of truth and warn the people of God. If you don't, sure, they're going to die for their own sins, but their blood is going to be on your hands. There's a sense of responsibility and urgency that you have. They're going to die for their own sins, even if you don't blow the trumpet, but you're going to have blood on your hands, which is pretty heavy thing to put on a prophet in the Old Testament. Well, that same mantle goes to us in the New Testament. Because Paul the Apostle in Acts 20, verses 26 and 27, tells the Ephesian believers, Therefore, I declare to you today that I'm innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. What is he talking about? I'm innocent of the blood of any of you. He's referring back to Ezekiel 33, 7 through 9. He's saying just like Ezekiel was responsible to blow that trumpet to warn the people of Israel about their sin, I'm responsible to blow the trumpet of the gospel. I'm responsible to gospelize, and I don't have anybody's blood on my hands, for I've not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. 
So I'm asking you this question. Are you taking those opportunities? Is there an urgency that you have in your life to reach the lost? Is that urgency passed on to your teenagers? Jude 23 puts it this way. Here's another urgency. Snatch others from the fire and save them. You talk about a visceral idea of somebody headed to hell and we're there to snatch them from the fire. Spurgeon, who was quite reformed in his theology, said this, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our dead bodies. And if they perish, let them perish with our arms wrapped around their knees, imploring them to stay. If hell must be filled, let it be filled in the teeth of our exertions. In other words, us calling out to them to believe. And let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. You and I have a gospel trumpet. Our teenagers have a gospel trumpet to warn those around us of what is to come, to point to them the hope that we have through Jesus Christ. Not just for eternity. We want to save students from the hell they're headed to and the hell they're going through right now apart from Jesus Christ. Our teenagers are walking through a living hell of bullying, of porn, of depression, of suicide, and it's all being amplified through social media. And we have to blow that trumpet to save them from the hell they're headed to and the hell they're going through. I don't know how many of you guys saw the video from Penn Jillette uh, about um, the time that he was um, approached by a Gideon after one of his Las Vegas shows, and he's an atheist, but one of these Gideons tried to give him a Bible, tried to share the gospel with him. And in this video blog, he looks in the camera and says, you know what? I wasn't angry at him because he really thinks when I die, I'm going to hell. And he's trying to stop it. And he goes, I never understood people uh, that don't evangelize, people that don't proselytize. He, lit he says these words, how much do you have to hate somebody not to try to reach them with the gospel. He says, if you know somebody's going to hell and you don't do something to stop it, how much you got to hate that person? Now think about that. That's out of the mouth of an atheist, a famous atheist, who appreciates a Christian trying to convert him. There is a reality that we have an urgency to do what it takes to reach the people around us with the gospel of Christ. Do you know William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, and by the way, he was a minister in London, walking down the streets of London, and he had had enough. He saw the prostitution. He saw the poverty. He saw the orphans. He saw the widows. And he said, here I am, just a minister in a church, staying safely within the, the four walls of the church. I'm done. I'm starting an army. He starts a salvation army, and he gets in the grit, and he raises up an army to get in the grit. And all over the world now, salvation army is there today because he wanted to save people from the hell they're walking through and the hell they're headed to. And he believed in the reality of hell. He literally said he wished he could make his final training for all of his Salvation Army, Army officers to dangle them over the flames of hell for 24 hours so they could see what's at stake for those who die without Christ. He had that sense of urgency. See, dot number one is God's sovereignty. It's job, God's job to save. Dot number two is urgency. It's our job to share. And I want to just stop right here and encourage you, don't be afraid to talk to your teenagers about the reality of hell. Of the 12 times Gehenna, hell, is mentioned in the New Testament, 11 are mentioned by Jesus. Now you may be thinking, well, I don't want to use scare tactics. I'm like, why? Why would you not want to use scare tactics if there's something scary? If I know a bear is over on the other side of that hill, I'm going to say, hey, don't go on the other side of the hill because there's a bear over there. Or if I see a little girl running toward traffic, I'm going to yell at her, not because I hate her, because I don't want to see her die. I think sometimes we underestimate the power of this reality, of this urgency, that if we really care about people, we're going to save them from, from the hell they're headed to. I remember I was speaking at a Dare to Share conference. I had a girl come up to me afterward and said, Okay, you talked about hell, and I've realized for the first time my teenagers, I mean my friends, are headed to hell. My friends who have not put their faith in Christ. Why has my youth leader never told me about this? 
Why has my youth leader never told me about hell? Because I'm sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, I need to do what it takes to rescue them. And I was like, and, and from the hell they're headed to right now. It's not just that, but it's also, it's not just then, it's now, right? That motivates us. I think sometimes we're afraid to talk about it. I, I hear people say, well, you know, our kids have had too much hellfire and brimstone. I'm like, really? Our kids? Maybe our grandparents had too much of it, but our teenagers have hardly ever even heard about it. And I want to challenge you uh, to take that urgency um, for real, to blow that gospel trumpet, to have that sense of, man, I need to, it's my job to share. I need to do everything. I, it's God's job to save. It's my job to share. That number three is responsibility. Responsibility. It's their job to believe. It's their job to believe. Romans 1, 19 through 20 says, What may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. Without excuse. From the time of creation, everything we see. I was walking uh, around Lake Arbor uh, this morning, I live in Colorado, in the Denver area. I watched the sunrise beautifully in the east and the rays of the sun shine off the snow-capped mountains of the Rocky Mountains. And it was this pink hue and it was just breathtaking. And every, anywhere you live, right, even Nebraska, those of you who live in Nebraska, there's beauty, beauty all around. You don't have to have mountains to see that beauty. You look up in the sky, you see animals, you see... It's beautiful. All that beauty is a billboard from God waving his arms saying, I created you. I created all this for you. It's, it says men are without excuse. People are without excuse because we know down deep inside. It's almost like there's this knowledge of God that's in a trunk that, that the unbelieving person sits on and is trying to get out. And you have to purposely sit on it to keep that knowledge down. The Bible says in Romans 1, we suppress the truth by our ungodliness. We're holding that truth down. Down deep inside, everyone knows there is a God. And it's their job to believe. So, God's sovereignty, our urgency, their responsibility. It's God's job to save it's our job to share. It's their job to believe. And here's the key with the three-dot theology. Don't connect the dots. Don't connect the dots. I hear theologians on both sides of this debate, those that are super Reformed and those that are super uh, Arminian, try to connect these dots. Let me tell you, these dots are above our pay grade. Let's take care of our own dot, right? Let's pray that God will turn the light from off to on in the souls of the unbeliever, and let's do what we can to get them to say yes to Jesus. Let's trust that God will do what only He can do, and that is save a lost soul. Don't connect the dots. We, especially in the United States, have a tendency to want to solve everything. We want to know everything, right? We want to connect the dots, but I believe when we, when we connect the dots when it comes to this, we rob God of his mystery and we rob God of his majesty. Let's live in the tension between the dots and let's take our job seriously and let's get our kids to live with urgency but also faith that God will save the lost soul. Back to my Uncle Richard. Twelve years after I gave the gospel at that funeral, 12 years of praying, 12 years of awkward gospel conversations, 12 years of every time he came back into town, my uncle's converging on him, trying to share Christ with him. 12 years later, he came back into town, uh, this time for another funeral, his own, because he had stage four cancer. Once a bodybuilder himself, he had shriveled up. He was going to die within weeks or months. Everybody knew it. And my uncles and aunts and cousins and myself were desperate. We're, we're doing, taking our responsibility seriously, urgency to share the gospel. We're praying, God, God, get him, get his soul. We're, we're trying to convince him that, man, you got to believe, you got to believe. 
Finally, my uncles, he was still resistant. My uncles invited him to come to the church. I was pastoring at the time. I was a church planner. They could start a dare to share on the side. They said, let's go hear our little nephew preach. Now, my uncles are bodybuilders, so when they mean little, they mean little compared to them. They're big dudes. My uncles, my aunts, my cousins come to church that day because he agrees. And it was like the sons of anarchy sitting in the back two pews of our church, right? And I preach my sermon at the end, like every time I give the gospel. And uh, I say, if that makes sense, and you're putting your faith in Christ right now, could you raise your hand? Boom, my Uncle Richard raises his hand. Boom, all my other uncles begin weeping because they're peeking through their fingers down the aisle. And in the three months he lived after that, my Uncle Richard led more people to Christ than the average Christian will engage with the gospel over the course of a lifetime. My Uncle Richard is with the Lord today because we trusted the Lord to save his soul, but we walked in urgency and we shared Christ every way we possibly could. And finally, he took his responsibility and he believed in Jesus Christ. By the way, if you're watching this and you've never put your faith in Christ, I want to tell you this. God loves you. He cares about you. Sent his own son to die for you on his behalf. Uh, on, on, on your behalf. He died in your place and my place for our sins. And he rose again from the dead and he says, if you simply trust in him, you receive that gift of eternal life through faith. Boy, if you've never put your faith in Jesus, it's not by being good, it's not by going to church. You can't be good enough. Our good deeds are a pi pile of filthy rags. But God saved us through faith in Jesus Christ. But it's your job to believe. Youth leader, Give the gospel to your students. Pray for them. Don't give up. Equip them with an urgency to share the gospel and give them a passion to pray for the lost because it's God who saves. Let me pray for you. Father, I just pray for every youth leader. May we not connect the dots. May we live in the tension. Give us absolute faith in you and your sovereignty. Give us a divine urgency and help us to do what we can to convince, to persuade others in the power of Christ to take their job seriously to believe. And Lord, use this three-dot theology to frame our philosophy of evangelism that we live out and that we equip our students to live out. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Jason and Carrie to talk to you a little bit about how you can take these realities, these theological truths, and really help transform your youth ministry in a very, very practical way. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks so much, Greg. Great sermon, great motivation for us. Uh, my name's Jason, and this is... Carrie. And we are here to share with you takeaways, tips, and tools from the Gospel Eyes with Greg Steer podcast that you are tuning into. Uh, coming out of this idea of three dots, uh, the biggest takeaway that hits me personally that, that is freeing for me is that concept of don't connect the dots. God's sovereignty, our urgency, their responsibility, those are three truths uh, that we, we embrace when we share the gospel, but we don't have to connect the dots. And for me, Carrie, that's like the most freeing thing about that concept. Don't connect the dots. Yeah, absolutely. It's so tempting to do that sometimes because we just want so badly for them to be saved. You know? right. and so it's, it's always tempting for sure. And I know what struck me really was that quote from Penn where it's like, how much do you have to hate somebody to not share the gospel with them? Yeah. I mean, that's just... Mm. It's so powerful. And that's an atheist's viewpoint. Yeah, like that's, I know. That's an atheist it's crazy, saying right? that. It's like, like, I don't believe oh. in your God, but if you don't tell me about him, you must hate me. Yeah. yeah. That's tough. It's that's like tough. crazy to think about that. If we could just pause, I think, in sort of the midst of our relationships and remember that, I think it would really help a lot. And, you know, no I really doubt. also loved hearing about the story of Uncle Richard and um, mm. how his family, Grace family, just continued to share with him throughout all those years. And, you know, we have family members, same kind of story, nine mm. years, just tried to share Jesus continually and was rejected so many times. And praise God, eventually she came to have a relationship with Jesus. And it was just awesome. But, you know, I love sharing those kind of stories with our students because it reminds them to own their dot, right. you know, to really remember what their role is and to not give up and to just consistently, persistently continue to share That's Jesus. a great word that we all yeah. need and our students need that sharing the gospel is not a one and done check the box I shared the gospel with Mike or Alice it's I keep doing that because I don't know when God is going to flip the switch I don't know when they're going to 
accept the responsibility to respond to that. So we go after it over and over. I think for those of us as youth leaders, uh, the best way that we can model that for our students, and so this would be a tip I would share with, with everybody, with you all, uh, from my own youth ministry experiences, we have to share the gospel every week in our youth ministry program. Sunday morning, Wednesday night, regardless of the format, when your students are there, we need to take that. We need to have that urgency to share the gospel. Yes, in our personal lives, but also when we're in front of our students. And I'll never forget. It's probably been 15 years ago, uh, and I was becoming familiar with Dare to Share and heard Greg talk about share the gospel at every meeting. And I was like, "That's crazy." But I was looking for something different in my youth ministry, so I grabbed some Dare to Share resources and I started sharing the gospel every week. And I will never forget for the rest of my life. Uh, was talking about the reality of heaven and hell. Uh, with our students, shared the gospel. I was like three weeks into sharing the gospel every week. And six out of my 30 youth group kids that I would have told you were believers in Jesus Christ had been raised in the church, six out of 30 kids made first time decisions to trust in Christ because I was given the gospel every week and the reality of heaven and hell and it finally clicked. And had I not been in that rhythm of sharing the gospel every week, who knows where those students might be. Uh, when I actually recommend a resource for you that may help you, this idea Greg talks about, we need to, we need to be able to preach and, and speak and share about the reality of hell as well as heaven. Uh, Dare to Share's got a couple of great resources, uh, Letters from Heaven and Letters from Hell. These are available on our web store. You can either get the audio, like the CD format, or as a digital download. It, it's a creative way. It's somebody other than you speaking to the realities of heaven and hell, but it gets it in front of your students in a creative way, a way they can relate to and allow you to, to broach that subject and so we got to speak about it eternity is a real thing the whole reason that we share the gospel is because eternity is at stake and so letters from heaven letters from hell uh, CD or digital download but great resources that'll help you in your youth ministry address these uh, but again share the gospel every week yeah for sure yeah I've used those many times in youth ministry and they're they're so powerful I mean mm. it's just unbelievable how much it touches the students hearts and really just kind of wakes them up to those realities no for sure and I know that I also am passionate about sharing the gospel every week in youth group, but also, you know, even as youth leaders for ourselves and our own personal relationships to right. remember to prioritize sharing our faith. And, you know, if, if you're not familiar with doing that yourself very often or a little nervous about how to approach that, we really recommend you just download the Life in Six Words app. It's just such a simple way so to go easy. through the gospel with someone, just kind of walk them through that. And it's just another great resource we That's have. It. So you can and hit, the, yeah, hit yeah. the app store yeah. and that Life in Six Words, but it literally walks through the GOSPL and, and prompts that decision. Great resource, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and comment. And on behalf of Greg and the whole Dare to Share team, we sure appreciate you spending some time with us. Thanks. Take care.